Good morning to you all and thank you for inviting me today to what is my first speech as the Rail Minister. Uh, though of course, as Darren mentioned, it's not the first speech I've given to a RIA event. Uh, many of you, as I look around, I recognise from seeing you up in Birmingham uh, at a dinner last month, you would have heard me, no doubt, pressing uh, the government, uh, asking what more we can do to deliver on our net zero and decarbonisation progress, raising the sort of questions you'd expect a chair of a select committee to raise for government. And I guess it's funny how things have worked out. Uh, if you believe in political irony, uh, this speech will be the one that responds to those questions that I posed uh, just last month. Uh, proof, perhaps, of the political turbulence that Darren has touched upon uh, from recent months. Um, but I'm glad to say that's now firmly in the rear view. It's a real honour to serve as Rail Minister. This is the job uh, that I've always wanted to do. I take responsibility for one of the most critical parts of national infrastructure. Rail is the connective tissue that improves lives and livelihoods. It boosts house building and high streets, and it will help us combat climate change. For the best part of two years, as chair of the Transport Select Committee, I had a fortunate front row seat watching the very best of rail during the very worst period in its history. The way that you all supported the country during the pandemic was nothing short of heroic. And now, as today's theme makes clear, we're in a period of transition. And I understand you want that period to be as short as possible, to get certainty on the industry's future direction. And believe me, my department wants that certainty too. So my priority is to get the details I need to start making some decisions, to unblock the delays to policy and publication, to resolve the political issues causing those delays, and to get rail moving again. The statistics underline why we need to get this right and get it right quickly. Rail supports hundreds of thousands of jobs and contributes billions of pounds to the wider economy. But rail cannot operate in a vacuum. The economic climate is challenging and the government must balance helping people and businesses confront the rising costs of living with a commitment to fiscal responsibility. That inevitably means tough decisions. Only then can we stabilise our economy, reverse rampant inflation and create the condi conditions for growth. Despite this, we have continued to support the railways. With over £16 billion earmarked since March 2020, protecting thousands of jobs whilst keeping goods and people moving. But that level of support, equivalent to £600 per household, is unsustainable. Rail, like all parts of the economy, must now earn the right to grow. At a time when savings are being sought, it must demonstrate a high value return on investment, that it can deliver value for money for the taxpayer, maintain momentum on decarbonisation and attract new customers through a transformation of services. I'll take those three key principles in order, starting, if I may, with efficiency. I want to see a strong pipeline of future rail projects. And I know that certainty around those projects drives your investment decisions. But the economic climate, the state of the industry's finances and sluggish passenger demand is making it difficult. I know that's frustrating for you, but I don't want to stand here today promising you jam tomorrow. And far from shying away from my previous views on what our railways need, and those are views I still hold, I want to be honest and transparent about what we can and what we will achieve. So rail enhancements, which are affordable, which serve new post-pandemic travel patterns, and which improve the passenger experience, will be given the green light. I also want to see further emphasis on freight. Working that out is taking some time, but I will give you clarity soon. 
Importantly, those future decisions will depend on the success of the current rail programme, and that programme is moving forward. With billions of pounds of enhancements across the network, programmes like Access for All and the completion of the Elizabeth Line in London shows this government is committed to building a railway fit for everyone and fit for the future. And we do remain committed to the integrated rail plan. With work already underway, including upgrades to the Trans-Pennine route, electrification of the Midland and Main Line, and the digital sig signalling rollout on the East Coast Mainland, these represent an opportunity for the industry to learn the lessons from previous infrastructure projects, to deliver at pace and to time and to budget, and to make the strongest possible business case for future funding. We need to bring that same rigour to decarbonising the industry. Despite carrying 9% of passenger traffic pre-COVID, only 1.5% of transport emissions was down to rail. Positive numbers, yes, but there's still more to do. More than 2,700 pure diesel passenger trains remain on the network, as well as many more diesel biomode and diesel freight trains. Electrification will be a key to a diesel-free railway by 2040 and a net zero network by 2050. And whilst we should be proud of our progress, with 1,200 miles of track electrified since 2010, clearly there are barriers slowing us down. As I said before in one of the Select Committee reports, a kilometre of electrified track can cost up to four times as much to deliver in the UK as it does to deliver in Germany. An incredible statistic underpinned, I know, by many very different reasons. But I want to work with all of you to put those right. And on those parts of the network where electrification isn't viable, we will continue to explore alternatives, building on the great work already done with battery and hydrogen power. Before I take questions, I would like to say a few words on rail transformation. Despite plenty of change outside the industry, one constant is the diagnosis from Keith Williams in the plan for rail. To attract passengers with flexible ticketing and better, more reliable services. To grow freight and put it at the heart of our network. To end fragmentation of track and train in the interests of passengers, freight and taxpayers, and to modernise how we maintain and upgrade the railways, and in the process, ensuring the safety of your staff. Even without legislation, we are making progress, combining the political appetite for reform with the energy and innovation of the private sector. I intend to nurture that partnership as we build a modern, sustainable railway this country needs and deserves. I realise previous Rail Ministers may have joked about the turnover rate of this role. Darren certainly did. As he's pointed out, I'm the third occupant in as many months. It will be a relief if I can get through this speech still in post. <laughs> but I'm also glad that my new DFT ministerial team is full of transport policy experts with great experience they're ready to get to work. The officials I have always worked with and have always rated, we want to deliver for you all. I'm also really glad that we have a stable, united government prepared to give you the greater certainty that I know that you have been waiting for. This government will always back our railways because whatever the national priority, be it economic growth, levelling up, or decarbonisation, a growing, sustainable railway is part of the solution. And my job will be to champion this great industry, making the case that even during challenging economic times, rail is one of the best returns on investment that taxpayers can ever make. And our surest way to a stronger, fairer, and greener economic future is through rail. Thank you very much. I'm now happy to take your many questions. <laughs>